Um, okay, so, uh, since I think um, Dmitry and uh, Vladimir, they are the main heroes of this panel, so I will be a kind of a chair, and I wanted to start with a question. And my first question is about me media fr freedom and power. Because, uh, you know, one thing is that in Russia today, obviously, like, you should not look for uh, many signs that there is no complete freedom of speech or uh, freedom of media. There are a lot of restrictions. At the same time, uh, like, in Stalin years, um, people of, I don't know, Dmitry's caliber, like Babylon or Mandelstam, they were, like, routinely slaughtered. I mean, nobody even cared about their um, um, about their um, importance. They were just, uh, some of the great writers were killed because they were great writers. Some of great writers were killed just because they were neighbors of someone or acquaintances. Some were just killed randomly. The same thing about Vladimir. Vladimir famously survived two ass assassinations um, on two assassinations, two attempts on his, his life. But again, in the 30s, um, a lot of journalists, a lot of intellectuals were killed in a kind of very routine fashion. They wouldn't even spend so much um, time and effort to kill in a kind of an, an elaborate way. They would just slaughter them. So I wonder, imagine that you speak to an ignorant American audience. You're not speaking to an ignorant American <laughs> audience, but imagine that you are speaking to an ignorant American audience, how would you describe the situation with freedom of media, freedom of speech in Russia today, so that to not to give an impression that everything is ideal and not to give an impression that we are in the darkest ch chapters of Stalinism or totalitarianism? Which one do you want to start? Um, Dmitry, by alphabet. First of all, dear friends, I must say, the essence of the situation when three Russians are speaking poor English in front of Russian speaking audience, <laughs> it's absurd enough, and that's the typical model of Russian press nowadays. We are speaking uh, official language, we shouldn't mention evident things, and for example, my Russian speech in comparison with my English one is maybe a kind of a skeleton of a beauty. Uh, you should believe that she was beauty sometimes, but now she's just the heap of bones. Just the same way we speak in Russian uh, in official press. And in comparison with reality, Russian official speech is just the pale shadow of this reality. We shouldn't mention the territorial problems. We shouldn't be extremist, extremists, which is punished. And you are extremist in any case when you are trying to criticize the power from any common position. When, for example, you speak about Crimea or Chechnya, you are calling to destroy Russia, to put it into pieces, and so on. Uh, so this kind of hypocrisy is normal for Russian audience, but Russian audience uh, has a great and a long habit for such uh, fabulous speech. She, uh, this audience uh, has a special training for reading between lines and for understanding all our metaphors. And so uh, maybe that's a kind of creative writing also. Of course, we're understanding each other. We know everything we want to say. And that's a kind of exchange of passwords. That's rather pleasant sometimes and very funny. I must say that censorship was really useful for Russian literature because it made us more symbolic, not so concrete, not so visual, but somehow metaphorical and metaphysical. Leo Flosev, in his famous work about uh, the pluses of censorship proved it. I must say that for me, for example, Russian situation is preferable. Russia is much more free than the USA because there is no practical responsibility uh, for your words. You can say anything which would be allowed, but there is no responsibility in front of your 
honor in front of your conscience. You can write everything you like, if it is allowed. And so when I asked one of my American students uh, how to evaluate modern Russia, is it the country of slavery or the country of uh, essential freedom? Because we are quite free uh, in all our deeds, in our morality, because there is no moral at all. He said that in Russia, freedom and slavery are not mutually exclusive. Maybe we are the country of the most free slaves. And maybe there is the only explanation which can somehow explain to the ignorant American audience why uh, the, Mo, uh, there is no metaphor. Oh, metaphor. Yeah, maybe, okay. you, yeah. maybe sometimes you will tell it to some ignorant students. I must say that this situation is beloved by most of population, is pleasant for most of population, because in the absence of morality, you are really free. You can do everything you like. You must not break any borders, uh, concrete borders, which you always know. So your life is regulated by the rules of the state, but not the rules of morality. And that's maybe Dmitry, the most pleasant situation. I, I'm sorry, as a normal Russian nowadays, I am spellbound when you speak. I'm used to hear your lectures, but I wanted to give Vladimir sure, an opportunity. That was my last phrase, and you guessed <laughs> I actually much prefer to be listening to yeah, yeah, But we, we, we all do right. this. We would all do this for the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 <laughs> years. We're just, you're doing something and you have a lecture yeah. of Dmitry on YouTube and it's a new lecture every day. Yeah. <laughs> and you could actually, in principle, you could order. You could like think of your favorite subject and you could have Dmitry's <laughs> lecture on this <laughs> subject. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you to the University of Chicago for hosting this conference and to Bill and Eugene for, for having us here. Um, and thank you for your question, Constantine. Uh, it's actually, I think, a very important one. And you, kind of, as a standard of comparison, you began talking about the, the 1930s, so kind of the classic uh, totalitarian dictatorship period that we had in the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and you asked how this compares to the situation today. Well, the best description, I mean, there are many descriptions for the type of political regime that we have uh, in Russia today that people have offered, including political science professionals, people have called it a hybrid regime, a semi-authoritarian regime, uh, an imitative uh, democratic authoritarian regime, many, many, many terms. But the best description that I personally heard about the type of regime we have in, in Russia today uh, was offered just a few weeks ago uh, by, uh, by Grigory Vlinsky when it was running in the so-called presidential election in March. When he said that the system that we have in Russia today is a postmodern dictatorship, a postmodern authoritarian regime. And I think that description just goes right to the heart of the matter because while the essence is basically the same uh, as before, um, a, a full-fledged rigid authoritarian state that does not allow for political freedom uh, or democracy, the appearance the, uh, the facade, if you will, is much more elaborate and much more creative and much more intelligent. Uh, and for example, elections themselves are a very good illustration uh, of that. So for example, I just, I, just, I, just, I just do not understand the issue of, of just the same. I mean, this was like sham elections and a fake campaign, right? But back 30 years ago, there wouldn't be any campaign. And no, no, it will no, be like uh, much more of a sham. So I, I wonder why it's the same. Because and I was just well, getting to that. So, so in the Soviet times, in the Soviet Union, as, as we remember, we also had elections in the Soviet yes, Union. Yes, of and course. The way they worked is you would, uh, of course, you would come to the polling place, you would get your ballot, which would literally have one name in it. And you would come to the box and you'd put it in, and that is how you quote unquote vote. And they wouldn't count the votes, so they would report 99% participation, 99% right. support. So uh, I guess so some things haven't changed because we still have several regions in Russia that report 90% plus for Vladimir Putin. But today, or I should say a month ago on the 18th of March, when we came to the polling places to the so called presidential election, and when we got our ballots, it looked like those ballots had eight different names of them as opposed to one. But of course, in essence, in reality, there was still only the one. And, and the competition and the choice uh, was a facade oh, and, and an illustration. I, I mean, I, 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 do not, I just do not see this. I, I, I read this in Dmitry's novels. I hear what, what, what you say, that it was the same, but in 80s and 70s, it was a dark city. You would not have a place where you would have a coffee, and you never 
see a decent coffee and you will have to wait for three hours in a queue for a uh, for a cup of coffee in a single chocolate. So, like, I, I understand that you're saying that this is more tasty. Uh, <laughs> no, and also, and also, are we talking okay, about? So, so, are we talking about political freedom? Or are we talking about coffee? No, about but, coffee, but, then but that's but, a totally different No, no, no. no, no, <laughs> no I'm saying uh, what I'm saying that uh, the political freedoms there are a lot of restrictions on them, but there were hundred times more restrictions back thirty years ago. So the, this is like uh, a, a totally different situation. Why it is the same? I even do not see any this kind of resemblance. Well, you don't see any kind of resemblance when we have the same man in power for more than 18 years. Well, you, could have, you could have voted for Yevlinsky, for God's sake. And there is a uh, hundred thousand Russians who actually seem to vote for him. Uh, <laughs> Misha, why? I, I mean, this is a Russian panel. I'm the chair. <laughs> what? I'm supposed to... to <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, if we want to be serious about this, the political system we have in Russia today is an authoritarian regime where you cannot change power through elections. I think there are many definitions of, of a democracy, but I think the main one of them is that you can actually go and freely elect or freely change the person you have in power. I don't think you would seriously try to argue that people can have seat Vladimir agreed. Putin in an election. That's the first thing. Uh, and this is why I say that, in essence, when we came to quote-unquote vote on the 18th of March, there was only one name on the ballot. Because as you know well, neither of the most serious political competitors of Vladimir Putin were on the ballot on March 18th. One, because he was killed three years ago, Boris Nemtsov, the former deputy prime minister of Russia, the leader of the Russian opposition, who was assassinated as he walked across a bridge in front of the Kremlin in February of 2015. And the other, Alexei Navalny, was not on the ballot because he was deliberately blocked from running by a Russian court sentence that was incidentally already found by the European Court of Human Rights to have been uh, arbitrary and unfair. So, you know, it's not difficult to win an election when your opponents are not on the ballot. And this is why I say that the names that were there, which ironically includes Yevlinsky himself, whom I just quoted as an example of giving a very good definition of this current regime, uh, this election in essence was exactly the same as the ones we had in Soviet times with one name on it. But if we want to talk about the media, uh, and that was the first part of your question, what's the situation regarding media freedom today? People who say that there is media freedom in Russia today always point out to, um, for example, media outlets like Novaya Gazeta or Echa Moskvi Radio, which are indeed, uh, in my view, professional, independently minded media outlets. Except, you know, Novaya Gazeta has a circulation of about four or 500,000 uh, print run. Echa Moskvi, which is the largest independent media outlet in Russia, has maybe three or four million uh, people, daily audience. When Vladimir Putin came to power 18 years ago, most nationwide television networks in Russia were actually independent of the government and were in private hands. Let's not forget this. Three out of the four television networks in Russia in the year 2000 were not controlled by the state. And they were the first targets of Vladimir Putin's regime. We have a saying, um, we have a saying in Russian, uh, and probably don't need to translate it because everybody understands it, but it, it translates as uh, those who will insult us will not survive for three days. And almost in line, in exact line with that saying, on day four of Mr. Putin's presidential inauguration in May of 2000, he sent armed operatives from the Prosecutor General Service and the tax police to raid the offices of Media Most, which was the largest independent media holding in Russia at the time, the parent company of NTV, which was the largest independent television channel. Within a month, the chief shareholder of NTV, Vladimir Gusinsky, was in prison and then uh, sent into exile. Within a year, NTV was shut down, or I should say taken over, uh, by Gazprom, the state-run energy corporation. And within the first three years of his rule, by the year, three, uh, by the year 2003, Vladimir Putin's government has, has, has either taken over or shut down every single independent nationwide television channel in Russia, establishing complete state monopoly over television. So, and that's another element of postmodernism, I think, because, on, again, on paper, you can say we do have independent media outlets in Russia, and we do, and, it's, and that certainly is different from the 1930s. What, what's, what, Except what, they're watched sorry, or listened. Just, what, what's so postmodern about Stephen Kiopan and, and restricting media freedom? I mean, they did this for a thousand years. Every dictator would send but the people to take over. But they wouldn't even leave a facade. This regime leaves a facade. We do have Novaya Gazeta, we do have Echa Moskvi, but they're watched or listened or accessed to by a, a very small number of people compared to NTV, which, you know, Kukli, the biggest satirical show on Russian television back in late 90s, early 2000s, was watched by tens of millions of people every week. 
And the most scathing episode of Kukli, by the way, came during the 2000 presidential election campaign at the end of January. It was based on a tale by Ernst Hoffman, a 19th century Prussian novelist that was called Little Saches. Uh, and, and the tale, as you know, of course, is about you know, a town whose residents came under a spell uh, of a wicked witch. And the effect of that spell uh, was that the residents of the town, was, with very few small exceptions, began to admire and worship an ugly dwarf, an ugly midget. And you can guess who portrayed the ugly midget in, in the Kukli episode. And we know from actually very close sources, a friend of a friend of, of, of Putin's then wife, that he was absolutely furious when he saw that episode. He was, he was running around his apartment saying, I'm going to bury him. He's going to rot in a prison cell with tuberculosis. This is a quote. And he was, of course, Gusinski, the owner of NTV. And again, Mr. Putin kept his promise. Within a month of his inauguration, Vladimir Gusinski was in prison. Not with tuberculosis, though. I have to ask okay, about that. Okay, people sure. voted against NTV on, in this election, so obviously. But I wanted to ask Dmitry just to continue, uh, to continue this line of comparing the current situation with what we had before. Dmitry, like, imagine that you are a Russian writer in the 70s. Like, what kind of, uh, of your 60, 60 books, which one will be published? Like, Perhaps cool, you know, because I have also good experience of um, mutual understanding, I should say, with censorship. Most of my books are also the metaphors of close Russian future. Uh, if I predict some new Russian Holocaust, I do it in such terms, such terms to avoid any political consequences. Uh, I can be deciphered by my reader. And most of my books would be written and read in Soviet Russian. <clears throat> More than this, maybe they would be understood much better. Maria Rosanova, Andrei Sinyavsky's widow, said once that Soviet power should be blamed for its deeds, but praised for its words. It was always calling for peace and enlightenment. The ideology of enlightenment was the foundation of Soviet life. Now we live in the so-called dark centuries. Try to imagine Brezhnev, who says out loud, we'll put our children in front of us, or we'll put your children in front of us, and try to shoot us, like Putin after the annexion of Crimea. It's unimaginable, really. Uh, there was no such defilement, such corruption, such cynicism, which we see now. And I prefer, by the way, uh, maybe the power which repeats correct words. Now it repeats only dirty words, which you all hear from Russian uh, ambassador in the United Nations. Um, okay, okay, th th that's fair, fair, and maybe we come uh, from different backgrounds, because I'm a social scientist, and certainly social science in Russia, it's totally incomparable. It was like dark ages for 70 years when social scientists were killed, the social science basically non-existent, and for the 25 years, um, students learn new things. We have good kids coming to universities to learn all the subjects. So it's like uh, 90s and the 2000s is the time of uh, like the social science in Russia. Um, uh, they, it, it's a kind of a comeback of a historical proportion relative to the dark ages when the social, Soviet social scientists, they would not just understand what great social scientists of the uh, of, of uh, early 20th century would write. I mean, they would literally unable to read uh, texts by uh, Russian economists of early 20th century because they were just totally ignorant and uh, they killed the, uh, their predecessors. So may maybe it's just my background that forces me to think that it's still way better than it was. But I wonder, uh, wonder uh, to publish 60 books in the Soviet Union, you will probably have to be a secretary of the, Soviet, of the Union of Soviet Writers. I, I'm pretty sure there was no single other author who would publish more than 10 books. Um, I, mean, I don't know, Yulian Semenov, but even he, he had pub publishing Vasily. problems. Vasil Bukov, I'm not sure that he was very good with publishing books. He published his famous... Um, Short, short novels, mostly in journals. Well, they were and he's just... In, in the revolution, then they were all translated into Russian, then they were all 
translated oh. in other languages, of the Soviet Union, then they were published in books, and eventually he became... Basically, the, the, that's just the way uh, this Soviet recognition worked. I mean, being translated into these languages is, is, is just, he got some money, but of course nobody read him in these languages. It would be quite enough for surviving to publish five or even three books. But now, uh, publishing 60 ones, I have practically no ability to live for my literary work. I always have to get some any um, jobs, something like teaching or journalism, which saves me somehow, or public lecturing and so on. So there can be no comparison with the, the 70s, because in 70s there was the status of literary worker, or writer, or critic, or whatever you want. Uh, I'm not nostalgic about this world, because sure, I think that writers should have the second profession, and maybe the second job. Um, and principally, I'm not against nowadays system. But I should say that in 70s I had a professional reader. Now, the amount of my readers uh, is not growing. I must say, maybe it is declining. But I wonder, how much is this uh, a complaint of being in a kind of a free world? Of course, uh, it was easy, perhaps, for Trifonov to be the best Soviet writer when readers were not allowed to read Nabokov or Davlatov or Solzhenitsyn or basically um, all the 20th, uh, 20th century Bulgakov. Um, Barely. Meaning, of course, it was uh, easier to be an author when someone would tell you that you are the great author. Now you are competing with Nabokov and Bulgakov and Chekhov for your readership. Maybe you are just complaining about this? No, I would say the context of the 70s was also much more fruitful and much more pleasant. Uh, there was no competition with Bulgakov and Nabokov, but there was competition with Solzhenitsyn and Trifonov, Ostrogatskis, for example, Tarkovsky father. I should say that Soviet literature and Soviet culture was much more prolific, uh, was really brilliant in comparison with modern free Russia, the so-called free Russia. Because maybe in the absence of freedom in the 70s, we also didn't have such defilement as we have now. Uh, Grigory Gorin said, uh, earlier we were buying the actors, and now all the spectators are bought. It's much cheaper. Um, uh, okay, so, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I wonder, still, uh, discussing R Russia, Russia today, how much do you make about personal uh, qualities of Vladimir Putin? I mean, is Vladimir Putin uh, someone who has like strong personal traits, so strong personal features, and uh, somehow imposes, so this is felt in the ideology, in the direction of the country, or he just like another Brezhnev, so a person without any kind of personal qualities, just embodying the majority, whatever is the majority, or, I don't know, the dominating ideology, something. Does he have any kind of um, personal trait? And the question is, uh, it's, it's not just a question about Putin, because I started to imagine a new scenario right now that, for example, suppose an ideal situation for liberal-minded people that we have a velvet revolution, a very peaceful transition of power to a very different leader, like Alexei Navalny is brought into Kremlin. And then nothing changes because Navalny thinks, okay, if I withdraw forces from Ukraine, then this is unpopular. If I stop paying uh, huge money to Caucasus, then I'll get problems. So I will just keep everything the way it, work, the way it works. So my question is, do you think it, that Putin has any spe special Putin's own traits and qualities? I think, well, there's, for a long time, there's been this debate in history about what's the role of, of personality and individual in, in, in history and determining history. I was, last year, I was at the um, Yeltsin Presidential Center in Ekaterinburg. Um, I had a <coughs> screening of my documentary film about Boris Nemtsov there, and then 
after the, after it or before it rather, I went to I went around to see the the, the exhibits. And by the way, I, I, I very strongly recommend if, if if you have a chance to, to go there to go to Ekaterinburg. It's, it's an absolutely amazing place. Claudia, could you so remember much. in your childhood, uh, in your Soviet childhood, visiting a Nicholas II Center or Romanov's uh, presidential um, Tsardom Center? No, I'm just pointing that there are, there are no, still no, no. differences. I can, yeah, I can they, see you are you are you're a very yeah. apparently big supporter of the current system. Well, no, that's, no, that's what it seemed like no, from, from no, all the comments I'm, you made. I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of I'm a kind of a supporter of more than black and white uh, view of the things. Sure, that's. I'm totally I, not I supporter. I completely. No, I mean I, 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 w I would not take this from anyone from but you. But okay, okay, I'm more, more supporter than you. <laughs> No, no, I cannot. Oh, the, to answer no, your question, I cannot uh, remember my childhood uh, visiting a Romanov Center, but uh, I cannot also not remember <laughs> in my childhood, which you know, my childhood was in in the end in the late Soviet period, which we which we often call the vegetarian period, when people were arrested rather than killed, as they were in the 1930s for opposing the regime. And what I also don't remember from my childhood is the leader of the opposition being assassinated by five bullets in the back. 200 meters from the Kremlin wall, which happened three years ago under Putin. I also do not remember that, and now it's happening. So yes, nothing is black and white, and some things are more black now than they were in my childhood. But I was in Yeltsin Presidential Center last year uh, for the screening of my film about Boris Nemtsov, the assassinated opposition leader. And uh, one of the halls in that museum, and by the way, it's more a museum of the era than of the man. It's more about the 90s and the brief period of democracy and freedom that we had in Russia. Uh, and one of the exhibits, uh, it's called the Hall of Successors. So it's about the people whom Boris Yeltsin thought of as, you know, his successors in, in, in the Kremlin, as successors as president of Russia. And you stand there and you see the kind of the gallery, the portraits, the faces from Boris Nemtsov to Vladimir Putin, with many people in between. And this is just a brief period of time. It's just from 97 to 99, just two years. And there were many people, six or seven maybe. I have a, I have a picture of that. And you can kind of, as you stand there and see, you can see that with every succeeding face, it gets worse and worse and worse. And it did go from Boris Nemtsov to Vladimir Putin. And I think, you know, looking at them, you can, you can, you can say that you know, almost anybody or, or anybody before Putin would have, in my view, been, been much better. And if you want to give an example of how important a personality an individual is uh, in determining historical events, I think uh, Mr. Putin is, is, is a prime example. And there are so many coincidences that led to him emerging as a, as a successor. I mean, just a, a year or a year and a half before he became president of Russia, hardly anybody's ever heard of him. Uh, you know, he's just showing papers somewhere in the presidential administration building on, on Ilyinka. Uh, and then, you know, there were all the things like the 98 economic collapse that damaged the political standing of, of reformers and liberals in the Russian government. There was uh, the bombing of Yugoslavia, the NATO operation in the spring of 99 that really turned Russian public opinion in a more anti-Western direction, many, many other things. And then, of course, there was a question of personal choice that people like Boris Berezovsky and, and Tatyana Dichenko and Valentin Yumashev made at the end of 99. But I think this really is an example of how a single individual uh, can change and can shape the course of events. And I think the bulk of the, of the reasons that we have such a political regime in Russia today uh, is because we have a man on the top whose background is, is, is in the Soviet KGB. And I know this may sound like a cliche, but, you know, frankly, everybody has their own background. You know, some people have an education in, in economics, like Constantine. Some people have an education in literature or history or physics or chemistry. And, 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 you know, all of us are taught different things in our educational backgrounds. Mr. Putin was taught how to lie, how to recruit, how to engage in disinformation and propaganda and uh, and, and, and many, many much worse things than that. And, and so have the people who are around him. Um, and it, it has been estimated that about 80% of the top positions in the Russian government today are staffed by former officers of the Soviet KGB. And uh, of course, as we all know from, from, the, from their own mouths, there's no such thing as a former KGB officer. Once KGB, always KGB. So yes, I think the nature of the political regime and the political system we have today is to a very great extent the product uh, of the personality of Mr. Putin, as well as the, his, the professional, if I can call it that, the professional background of him and of the people around him, people like Sechin and Ivanov and all the others. 
Dmitry, <clears throat> unlike, unlike us, as a leading poet uh, in Russian tradition, you directly speak to Putin, even if he does not always reply to you, but I suppose you, you, you speak to him. So what could you uh, make of him? I had only one talk to him. That was during the book exhibition in Paris, awful to say, 12 years ago, he was 13. And they asked him, what would you prefer to read? What is your preferable kind of books, genre, type, and so on? Maybe family saga, maybe something like science fiction. And he said very openly, if I tell you, all of you will write only this. <laughs> <laughs> so he understands. Oh, that's, that's a good He's sincere, mm -hmm. yes, he's cynical enough. And he understands very well the kind of his people. Uh, so I'm happy that he did not. <laughs> no, but uh, 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 of course this is. By the way, the, the, sorry, there was famous Russian writer, humorist, and satirist Valery Popov, and I told him after it, I feel myself uh, just like after some awkward sex with a young girl when you can't understand the consequences. He said, "In the, in nine months you will see." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, okay. No. I. I mean. Uh, of course, this would be a gross mistake on my part if I confuse you with the uh, with the protagonist uh, with the speaking voice of your book. But I suppose that you are trying to speak to Putin and to influence um, influence uh, the uh, course of the Russian history the way it's described in the June in the June novel, so that's what I said. Uh, well, you are very close to the truth because in my seminar with uh, students which were taught uh, creative writing, I discussed with them the book which could influence Putin. It was a long discussion, and I am sure that we know such a plot. I would be able to write a book which would change his mind radically. Maybe uh, he would retire after it. Maybe he would leave Russia at all. Please Maybe, write it. Uh, yes, Please uh, write yeah, it. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> I am working on it. <laughs> but no. it's very evident and very close. You know, he dislikes people, but he loves animals. And so the plot of the book will be devoted to tigers. He loves <laughs> Siberian tigers. And he's sure that he is born to defend them. And maybe to recount somehow this special, this biological special, which maybe is in great damage now, in great danger. And so, that would be a novel about the mm, chief of the zoo. Uh, <laughs> Who becomes a, ti a tiger, like no, eventually, no? No, no. can't become a tiger. It's not a science fiction, but it's a realistic novel, but a metaphor. Oh, I thought it's uh, a science fiction. So, okay, but... he, wants, he wants to keep the tigers, but he knows that they can continue their life and they can give birth and give leaves to the new tigers only when they are free. But he is not able to give them freedom. And when he understands this contradiction, he begins to kill them drastically. And in the final episode, he is standing alone, all covered by blood, among the dead tigers, the chief of this small population. I am sure he would understand that would be a dramatic novel. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm... Um, Thank you. Nobody tried to take it. <laughs> you see the history of Russia in the making, at least the history of Russian literature in the making, maybe the history, the political history of Russia in the if uh, Dmitry succeeds with the uh, Putin... <laughs> Putin train <laughs> books. Yeah. Well, maybe Leonardo DiCaprio will play this role, you know. <laughs> I'm always dreaming about writing a screenplay which will give me some money. Because I'm sick and tired of writing 61st books. 61st one. And so I hope to uh, maybe to become Hollywood screenplay. And I am sure that this play, this movie, would be one of his adorable. He loves to be the tragical hero. But and by the way, he said once, not to me, sure, I'm not his friend, but to Vladimir Solovyov, who 
who is famous TV person and one of his best friends, he said, I know, I understand very well that our people is shitty. The same word, shitty. <laughs> and so the contradiction between great leader and shitty people would be the foundation of this movie. <laughs> it will destroy his mind. <laughs> okay, but do you think that his mind, uh, as it stands now, uh, that it influence, uh, influences the course of the election, or he is just a generic Russian, generic Russian leader? Mm, like, we, we never think about Leonid Brezhnev as a, as a person, right? Even if you read his biography, he's still not, well, not know, a sort of a person. Uh, uh, you know, Brezhnev surely had some ideals and even some principles. By the way, he said, to Konstantin Simonov in 1965. Till I'm in this chair, there would be no big blood in Russia. And maybe he kept his promise. There was no big blood, like for example, no Russia is kind of crucial. He kept it. Uh, Putin also has principles. He wants to keep the population by any cause, but under any conditions, but he doesn't understand that there is no conservative way to keep the nation. There's only the uh, well, developing and many or reforming. He is conservative, but conservation never keeps nation. That's only the way to decline. Um, okay, could I could I ask you a question about about y your role? I mean, this is a kind of since you are only planning to change Putin mind, but maybe you could change uh, some. Your own uh, mind. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Oh, so there are people between us and Putin, so you could change other people's, uh, pe people's mind. Do you think that the Russian elite, the intellectual elite, the cultural elite, it somehow uh, fail, failed Rus Russian people in <coughs> 90s and 2000s? That there were some things that, were, they, that we, they could not have been learned by experience, because obviously in 90s, Russian people wouldn't have any experience of democracy or voting or losing in uh, competitive elections. Uh, for example, the only elections that Russian people feel were fair are those that were actually uncompetitive. Like if you, uh, if you ask Russians about which elections were free, they would say election 1991, when Boris Yeltsin got three times more, uh, more votes than the runner-up. So it's, it was basically non-competitive and the Putin's election in 2000, which was not also not competitive because he got three times more votes than the runner-up. But the real competitive elections in 1996, everyone thinks that they were rigged, although there is no hard evidence of this. So I'm just saying that um, Russian people were unexperienced with democracy, unexperienced with media freedom. So uh, not surprisingly, they hate democracy, they embrace censorship. But should not have the elite be cleverer than they were and understand these things and then try to explain this to other people. What do you think? I think the first left is very close. Uh, or hemutlik, like you say in German. Uh, so the Russian life is totally uh, free from any kind of responsibility. And so Russian population needs no free elections, needs no political life, no political reforming or creation. Putin is responsible for everything. It's rather comfortable for most people. And this cozy, stinky, warm swamp, which is Russia now, maybe that's the most adapted, the most beloved way of life uh, for the post-Soviet population. They need no political activities at all. After Putin's death, they will blame him. In 10 years, they will praise him again. And this circle would be repeated uh, maybe for eternal times. But should, shouldn't be the, should not have been the elite explaining to people that it's bad to be in a swamp. Although this elite might have felt personally that this is good to be in a swamp. But they might have guessed, like reading about other nations, reading books, just thinking and guessing that this is bad to be in a swamp, that you need to move fast in the, as the Red Queen in Alice uh, and the, um, behind the mirror says, that you need to run to, to stay in the same place. Try to explain to drug addict that drug is bad for him. Try to explain to sadist, for example, or masochist, that his uh, 
uh, sexual perversions are dangerous. Maybe there would be no success this way. You shouldn't explain it. You can demonstrate it somehow. But the dangers of American or Western way of life are too evident. So I am sure there could be no propaganda of free uh, and the safe life. They are very, um, uh, I should say, they are very fond of this one. They are patriots of this one. Uh, so, Vladimir, should the elite should have it like really propagandized media freedom and democracy, just put it in their hands that democracy is better than anything well, else. First of all, I just want to completely disagree with the premise that both you, Konstantin, and Dmitry have just advocated. And, and that is the premise that Dmitry very eloquently, as usual, expressed in, in, in the contradiction between a great leader and shitty people. I mean, there's this really widely held stereotype about the Russian people, that the Russian people somehow dislike democracy, dislike political freedom, that all they yearn for is a, is a strong hand and a stern whip. Uh, and, you know, as a historian by education, I prefer to deal with facts as opposed to stereotypes. And as so many other stereotypes about any other people, you know, this stereotype is just patently false. Because if we actually look at the, at the facts rather than the myths, every time uh, the, the Russian people actually got a choice between uh, dictatorship and democracy, as opposed to just being told how much they hate democracy and love a strong hand. When they actually got a choice, they chose democracy and freedom. 1906, the first ever election uh, to the Russian parliament, the Russian Duma. Supporters of the Tsarist autocracy, who had all the apparatus of the state at their disposal, failed to win a single seat in the state Duma, zero. The majority was won by the cadets, the Constitutional Democratic Party, the party of, of Pavel Milikov, whom Bill just referred to at the beginning of, of our conference as lecturing in the University of Chicago in the early 20th century. They won a strong plurality of the seats. And in order to reduce liberal and democratic presence in the Duma, uh, the Tsarist government had to reduce the franchise, not increase it in the famous 3rd of June coup in 1907, so-called coup. 1917, election to the Constituent Assembly, which was held four weeks after the Bolsheviks seized power uh, by force in a coup d'etat. And they lost that election. They lost it to the SR party, which advocated which was left-wing, which, which advocated for a democratic parliamentary republic in Russia. And again, they had to disperse that assembly by force. 1991, the election that you just referred to, it was a landslide, but it was a landslide for the democratic opposition candidate, Boris Yeltsin, against the candidate of the then ruling Communist Party of the Soviet Union, former Soviet Prime Minister, um, Rishkov. Rishkov, right, Nikolai Ivanovich Rishkov, who received 17% to Yeltsin's 57%. That was a resounding choice for democracy and freedom. And I would actually agree with you completely on the 96 election, in which despite all the hardships and the difficulties and the economic problems, despite everything, the Russian people still opted to continue with Yeltsin's presidency and rejected a communist restoration personified by Zugan. No, I'm just surprised so, that, that no, nowadays these elections are remembered by some, uh, as somehow rigged, even by those right. people who were working for Yeltsin or voting for Yeltsin. And that's another stereotype. Yeah, that's, that's, kind of, stereotype that's kind of a very strange, strange but thing. But on the question about the elites uh, failing the people in the early 90s, I do agree with that premise, because in fact, if you look at all the mistakes that were made in the early 1990s, uh, they were made by the elites and not by society. I mean, the, one of the best examples, I, I think that one of the biggest mistakes, one of the most consequential mistakes made by the Democrats, Yeltsin's government in the early 1990s, was that they rejected uh, any attempts to kind of really take account of the communist past, whether it's by illustrations like happened in other countries in Eastern and Central Europe, or at least something like what happened in post-apartheid South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There was nothing. I mean, there were some initial moves to open some of the archives, but then they were quickly shut down again. There was a law illustration introduced by Galina Starovoitova in the Russian parliament. It was rejected, and so on and so forth. But if you actually look at the public opinion surveys of that time, uh, what is now called the Levada Center, then was called FTSUOM, the, the old Russian public opinion center, research center, it actually showed, the surveys show that more than 50%, a majority of Russians, agreed with the premise that those people who held senior positions in the old communist regime should not be allowed to continue in the government positions in new Russia. And it was the elites, not the people, who but made it. Th that's a good point. But, in the, but isn't this kind of moot? Because you could not have imagined illustration which would illustrate uh, Putin or uh, Sergei Ivanov or uh, Vladimir Volodin or other people, or Sergei Kirienka. I mean, this, the... You mean the, going forward or no, back then? What, 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 I, what I'm saying, that 
those people who were not illustrated, they actually never came to the top of power. They hanged in the parliament. Wow. Uh, some of them, uh, some of them actually spent some time in jail because they participated in some of coups. But yeah. what I'm saying that they were like the illustration in 1991 could not have helped with the rise of Putin and his people in 2000s. I think because it could. I think it could. I mean, Kirienko I mean, is you, a different thing. No, look, but somebody... You, you, would, you would illustrate a low, a low level people who worked in security services, just, li just like for, for, for a person who was like a lieutenant or captain in a security services? First of all, Sergei Ivanov was a general in the KGB. That's not a lieutenant or captain. That's not a low ranking services. And, and yes, I mean, c well, can you imagine in the 19... 50s West Germany, uh, an SS officer coming to power? Yes, of course, illustration would have addressed it. Again, Kirienko and Volodin, that's a different story. But active officers of the Soviet repressive services? Yes. They would, if you read the, actually the draft law, it's publicly available, we can read it now, that was uh, proposed by Galina Starovoitova in December of 1992 to the Congress of People's Deputies of Russia. It lists uh, specific categories of people uh, who are to be you know, illustrated, limited from holding positions of power. And no, it does not include all 18 million or however for many, how many years? members of the Communist Party. I think for 10. We can, for we 10, can look at okay, it. they came to power after 10 years. No, they came to power eight years after the August 91 revolution. Putin came to power in the summer of 1999. No, what, 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 what I'm saying, I'm, what I'm trying to, to say, that it was not a sheer fantasy uh, back in 1991. It was probably a realistic thing. But now, when with the benefit of hindsight, we, this was a sheer fantasy. This. Could, could have not conceivably influenced what happened to I disagree, Russia. and in fact, it's not just about the personality. So you ask who's, which specific people would have been covered by that law, and I think, we'll need to go back and look at it, but Ivanov as a general of the KGB definitely would have, that's not even a question. Putin as a colonel probably would too, but the more important aspect of this is, if there was a real, pro pro I mean, illustration means cleansing, right, in Latin, if there was a real process of public reconciliation, or I should say, you know, the public finding out the truth about all the aspects of the former regime. If all the archives were opened, if all the crimes of the KGB were publicized and, and uh, as they were in, in other former secret services in Central and Eastern European countries, not even limiting the specific people, but just publicizing the fact that this was a criminal organization. I don't think it would have been possible for an officer in that criminal organization to become president of Russia. Um, Dimitri, um, criminal organization. <laughs> yeah. I am totally non-competent in this sphere. I know only, and this is really important, that today um, the so-called Basmanian court refused to let Alexei Malabrovsky to go under home arrest. Mm -hmm. The investigators were asking, the investigators themselves were asking to let him go. But he uh, stays in prison, and that means that the criminal structure of Russian power is now evident to all the world. It's a kind of sadism, because he was promised that he, being 60 and ill, will be let help. Uh, under arrest, again, without any rehabilitation, without um, any stopping of all this system. No, uh, he is just, uh, maybe, he's just the subject of permanent struggle between the investigators and the so-called one of towers of crime. <coughs> and now we see, and maybe that's the best evidence of criminal nature of all Russian state now. It touched the court, it touched uh, the culture, and uh, anything you like. And so in this state, the notion of crime is banned at all, because everything is criminal. So I, I wonder how do you how do you draw a line between the state and the country itself? Because I, it's like one one personal example. I never I never voted for Putin. I have always op opposed Putin. I was once fired probably because of uh, Putin. I was uh, was in a position. I was helping an opposition candidate. I was no. What I'm saying. Okay. What 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 I, I'm saying. I have never been uh, for him. But I love uh, football, um, soccer in American language. Um, I love football, so I have always been supportive of the World Cup in Russia. But now, whenever I write, I, I've written this for seven years, but whenever I write this, then 
uh, like I would no, not have about the coming World Cup and how it's great for Russian people and that uh, million people in Russia uh, paid non insignificant sums to buy tickets to this event and how everybody, how a lot of people are happy about this. But I have a huge pushback from all of my friends, basically, from all of my peer group saying that this is just like a Putin's propaganda plot. This is like Berlin Olympics. But I wonder, when Lev Landau proved his theorems, when Dmitry Shostakovich was writing his music, when Sevalod Bobrov was scoring his goals, when Maya Plisetska was dancing her dances, when Boris Pasternak was writing his poems, were they just supporting Stalin's regime? Or there is something, yes. uh, something good that could happen in <laughs> Russia, not being just Vladimir Putin plot to promote his Vladimir Putin's there regime. There is some difference between fascism regime and Stalin's regime. There was the war against them and Stalin won. There was difference between communist regime supported by Pasternak and fascist regime supported by Lenin. I was interviewing Leni Riefenstahl when she was 100 years old and visited St. Petersburg. And by the way, I was that guy which managed to press the door through to come to this press conference. And I saw her, like you, very closely, and I asked her, how could you do the movie Olympia? She said, I was just so fond of sports. That's just the same. <laughs> just the same. Sure, everybody is responsible. Every German which wasn't prosecuted for anti-fascism is responsible for fascism. No, when I said about Pasternak or Shostakovich, I didn't mean when they signed letters uh, praising Stalin or uh, other officials. I, I mean when they were writing their beautiful poems or their beautiful music. Were they uh, uh, supporting the regime when they were doing their job? Uh, that was the kind job. of protest, sure. By the way, Pasternak said, I feel such an envy for Shostakovich. He needs no words. Yes, he can that's, express everything. That, that's, what, that, that's why I <laughs> had Shostakovich and Pasternak in this year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so, and I do you agree? So anything good. If, if a writer writes a book, then he supports, he supports or she supports Putin. If a dancer dance, dances a dance, right. then she's supporting Putin. If a, foot, if a football player scores a goal, then this is just... Supporting Putin. That's a big debate that actually was kind of reignited with the Sochi Olympics in 2014. And, and you'll yeah. remember that article by uh, Viktor Shandorovich who compared this young um, Olympic uh, athlete who won the gold medal in Sochi, a girl, I don't remember her name now, but she, she did this beautiful, well, dance, I guess we can call it. And Shandorovich wrote this piece comparing her. Y Yulia Lipnitska the, or Adelina Sotnikova? Lipnitska, the first one. Exactly. Of course, her. yeah, they both were beautiful, they were both And so he wrote a piece comparing her to a, a famous German athlete who, was, who won the gold in 1936 Olympics, and his whole point was that, you know, by these sporting victories, these people basically are supporting the regime. So he was basically put it, pushing forward the premise so, that you just yeah. raised. The way, that's a very difficult question of, of, of uh, whether, you know, the people who do not elect these regimes, because we don't have free elections in Russia today, whether everybody who's doing something important is responsible. The way we kind of, I think we found a golden I, 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 will, I will make it more difficult. Think of, uh, think of, Bach, of Mikhail Bakhtin, who was uh, writing his famous book in a totally dismal conditions. Like, in no way he was supported th this regime. Right. But this, is, was a, this was a major piece of scholarship done in this. This is sort of a kind of justified this epoch. Or think of people who uh, were creating mathematical schools in Moscow. They were prosecuted by the government. They were forced into exile. They were right. stripped of their work. They, would, uh, they were sent in 1979. Some of them were sent uh, for... Uh, for pre uh, to prison, um, one person was probably killed because they tried to teach mathematic, uh, mathematics to kids. And basically you're saying that they were supporting Brezhnev when they were doing this? I'm not saying that at all. I didn't say anything like that. Uh, then, what, then what Slipnitska is doing? Like, Putin organized the Olympics I just the champions of the soccer. It's not like... No, no, it's not. No, first it, all, it's not Putin. Putin used uh, was, used the Olympics to uh, promote himself. But that's what people do. They took others' achievements and make it their achievements. That's people give. So no, I was just quoting the article by Shandorovich, and mm -hmm. then I was going to say that the way we kind of found, I 
think what is the right equilibrium and the right balance between those two opposing views that on the one hand everybody who does, who for example participates in sporting events supports Putin and on the other hand, you know, how do you fight against that, do a total boycott, don't go to Olympics, don't go to the football championship. I think the way, the way we found a balance in between those two, the, this was the position of Boris Nemtsov before the Sochi Olympics and this is the position, that, for example, I have now before the, this summer's football world championship in Russia is that you know, the sporting people, they should go. This is what they do. I mean, they play football. This is their life. This is their profession. There are, as you said, millions of fans who are waiting for them to do this. But the heads of state and government, the presidents and prime ministers of, of democratic nations should not go and serve as models for Putin's photo ops during the opening ceremonies and the handshakes and the red carpet receptions as they did in Sochi in February of 2014. And yes, those Western leaders who do go and pose next to Putin for photographs, yes, they are supporting the Putin regime and they should not do that. Sorry, I, 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 cannot, I, I do not care about Western leaders, that's just uh, respect to these issues. Dmitry, I, I wonder, like, you're, I, I will keep pounding on this, you're perhaps the most important uh, literary uh, figure in Russia today. Like, do you, th do you think, <laughs> do you think like, that what you do as, a, as an author, uh, as a writer, as a poet, that this uh, somehow um, is a support for Putin, this is somehow glorifies his ear, that if this, is, uh, this has a kind of a bad reflection on you, if uh, in 50 years we will uh, remember Putin's name only because he was living in the you period when... <laughs> uh, okay, why, why do we know Ben Kendorf? Actually, I, I would, I would, I'm pretty sure that much uh, fewer Russians would know about Nicholas I if not for Pushkin. That's, it's, it works exactly this way. Russian past is great, Russian present is uncomfortable, and Russian future is unpredictable. That's great, but it's better than all Pushkin's words about the freedom. Or more useful, I should say. No, I don't support the regime, uh, and maybe it's impossible to support it. My, a very interesting point. In Russia, Nabokov was always, not always, but in the 90s, it was the symbol of political aestheticism, I should say, political skepticism. Because Stalin and Hitler were equal to him. But now he's just maybe the symbol of political opposition. And his most popular novel is Ben Sinister, which was totally not readable in, and not popular in the 90s. Now, only anti-Stalin and anti-Hitler Nabokov's uh, books are read and understood, really. And maybe his most popular words now is, I can't hide myself into my small tower of Ebony. Na because Nabokovs? Nabokovs were From my, my kids' uh, classmates in high school, uh, Lalita is still doing no, well. Not yeah. Lalita. Not yeah. Lalita, because Lalita is not anti totalitarian. Lalita is scandal. But Ben Sinister is maybe his most reprinted and read novel. He wrote to his sister My small ebony tower can't save me from all these dead children which were as cute and funny as my own, written in 1944. And maybe now you should be a position, because if you try to sing about uh, beauties of nature, you surely support this new type of fascism, or this proto-fascism, as Umberto Eco called it. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to say that this is unfair and ungrounded to say that if someone prove a good theorem or dance a good dance or make a performance or is, is a great artist or is a great sportsman, then this is like by itself is a support. So for me, if a, uh, if a figure skater goes to a, to a public um, meeting and praises Putin, then she supports Putin. But if she just uh, makes a beautiful performance or she uh, won an Olympic medal, then it's totally irrelevant and Putin is, uh, Putin is uh, lucky that he is the leader of a country for which this girl uh, is playing or dancing or writing poems. You know, in Russia there is such an expression that sportsman is defending the honor of the country. I am quite sure that sportsman or anybody else defends the honor of the country if he is protesting. 
Otherwise, he declines and denies the owner of the country and supports this decline. By the way, your beloved author, Sherbakov, who was always just very far from any politics, now published his recent al album, which is full of political songs, uh, rather decisive, I should say, and rather radical. Yeah, OK. Still, uh, still this yeah, argument. <laughs> I do not consider this as a kind of a deaf, uh, deaf uh, con confrontation. I'm, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying, to, uh, trying to figure out because I support, uh, for example, the Russian government attempts uh, today as well to promote promote science. And when people do great research uh, in um, in new universities, I do not think that they somehow help support Putin's power and that they should not do this research uh, because this will be a form of protest. No, I, I, I totally don't, don't think so. But, okay, but what should have been done by the elite? I mean, what, okay, what, I, I just wonder, do you think, do you have a feeling that something went wrong? I mean, that something should have, shouldn't be done differently? by elite, not by the political powers. I understand what the political powers did wrong, but the writers, the intellectual leaders, what they could have done differently. I think if we want to talk again about what happened in the early 90s, I think a lot of, um, I presume by elite you're referring to cultural figures, right, and people who are considered moral authority by Russian society. A lot of them actually were warning back then, well, not warning even, but saying that those are the things that should be done. Uh, and it's the political powers uh, uh, that I, could give you, to I could I could give you a simple example. Could you think? Uh, could you think of a single Russian intellectual who would uh, say that the movie Brat or Brat the Second is a kind of a bad movie? That these these are wrong values. This is exactly like this resentment and aggressiveness and everything that led to Crimea and all this thing. That's all caught in these movies, but who has not praised it? Like, everyone admired, admired this. I was lucky, I watched it first in 2017, so I was just wow. horri horrified, was yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> of course, yeah, after, uh, let's let them respond to this, and then maybe we can open it up to the audience uh, for, for some questions from the audience as well. Okay, sure. Um, I will just say that until last week, I only knew the city of Chicago by Brad Dva, so I'm really happy to, to be here. No, be what, what I'm saying, but did you like the movie? Yes, I did. Uh, but this is about uh, taking Donetsk and uh, pushing Americans from there no, who attacked us. First oh. of all, I'm not saying I agree with all the premises that, that are in there. You can, you, can, you can admire something as a work of art without necessarily agreeing with, yeah. the, with the point of it. Sympathi sympathizing with the main character. I'm not sure I do, but I definitely like the films, most of them. Uh, and, and, and in any case, those films, I mean, you, you said that you only watched it a couple of years ago, last year, but they were actually, I think both of them were filmed, if I'm not mistaken, 99 and 2000. So that's already kind of I'm early Putin's period. 99, 99, 99 2000. 2000. Yeah, or 2001. Yeah. yeah. Dimitri, but the, the general question about the uh, elite missing something, and I brought the example of the movie Brat as an example that this was um, this was a movie that basically showed that everything is totally wrong. The, the fact that everyone loved it, and now I think that people who uh, are unhappy with what happened in Ukraine and with the, uh, what happened in Crimea, uh, they should have um, uh, wish they should wish they never praised Brad or Bradva. During our meeting, I read in Facebook, I'm sorry, a very important phrase. <laughs> yeah, we we'll always say, and it's, it's still not forbidden, last days maybe, <laughs> uh, to enjoy it. Uh, a very important phrase. In Russia, we usually say that the fish becomes rotten from the head. The problem with modern, modern Russia is that there is practically no difference between heads and tails. So this fish is totally rotten. And there is no elite at all. Uh, Brad Dwa Brother to the so-called The Sequel for Brother, was the movie of uh, maybe uh, of previous time, 
where we had some positions of our symbolics and something else. Now everything is mixed and there is no principal difference between Daniel Bagrov and his enemies. They all are brothers. And maybe that's the worst which could happen to Russia. In the first movie he said, you are not my brother to one of Armenians. Now we all are brothers. Uh, and uh, like in previous Balabanov's movie, which was called Aurora Pelvidi, we all are monsters. No people, only monsters. Monstrous brothers. Mm. Um, okay, well, on this note, we could uh, invite some questions from the audience. Yes, please. Hello, I'm Natalia Rudakova, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I'll be speaking in the second part of the conference today. I am curious about the notion of mor moral leadership that both of you brought up. Koyta um, Rul is currently um, conducting this pretty interesting survey of its readers on uh, who they consider to be a moral authority these days. Uh, do you, first, do you guys know about this uh, little survey that they're doing? And secondly, what is your sense of it? How things might turn out? Do you think that the need for moral authority uh, that this kind of survey is clearly showing, um, do you think that need is stronger today in 2018 than it was in 2014, than it was in 2000? In other words, what's your sense of how the, uh, this kind of moral collapse and moral confusion that accompanied the fall of the Soviet Union, what's your sense of how that's um, unfolding? Are things starting to be a little bit clearer now morally? Is, is the fact that Koyta is conducting this kind of survey and maybe an indication of, of it? Just any thoughts on that? Thank you very much. That's actually, a, I think that's a crucial question and a crucial point. Um, the first time that Dmitry and I met in person was in October of 2007 when we were both at a rally in Triumphalne Square in support of the nomination of Vladimir Bukovsky as a candidate for president of Russia. This was an initiative that a group of opposition activists undertook in 2007-2008. We knew, I was a chairman of that group, we knew very well that, of course, Bukovsky is not going to be president of Russia. We knew very well that he won't even be allowed to be a candidate for president of Russia, as indeed he was not. He was taken off the ballot by the Central Election Commission, as most opposition candidates are. For us, the point was to show that our opposition to the Putin regime is not about specific economic policy or tax policy or military policy or whatever else. It's about the fundamental moral question, that these people are on the wrong side of morality. That's our problem with them. And so we decided to take a figure who was symbolic you know, Vladimir Bukovsky, of course, a towering figure in the Soviet dissident movement, somebody who personified and symbolized you know, the, the opposition to the communist regime when it meant spending years in the gulag and in prisons and in psychiatric hospitals, which he did 12 years of his life before being forcibly exiled to the, to the West. So we took a kind of a, you know, unquestionable moral authority and, and, and said, okay, this is the man we're going to put up against uh, Putin's anointed successor, Dmitry Medvedev. Well, it turned out to be a placeholder, not a successor, but we didn't know that at the time. So. That was the point of that initiative. And I think this, this, this underpins quite a lot of what we're trying to do. I mean, Boris Nemtsov always likes to say that the problem with the people who are in power today in Russia, again, is not in specific policies. It's not that they do this wrong or that wrong. It's that they don't respect the Ten Commandments. I mean, he said it really sound, and that's a simple way of saying it, but it goes to the, to the heart of the issue, I think. You know, it says, thou shalt not kill, and they do. Thou shalt not steal, and they do. And that, that's the problem. And I think the point you raised is an absolutely mm -hmm. fundamental one, that the whole, the whole basis for opposition today in Russia should not be about specific issues, but it should be this fundamental moral question. So I have not heard about that Kolta survey, but thank you for mentioning it. I'm going to go. We are on the list of the... Sure, I will vote for you the... the uh, no, of course, right. here. Yeah. But I will, I'll go and have a look at it now. Thank you for, thank you for mentioning it. Um, the morality. I know only that I am on the 21st place. Oh, so Russian he does know about this. <laughs> uh, which is much better, for example, than most Russian, more modern writers, because they don't read them. Okay. But sometimes they hear my lectures and they know my name. And I know that the next one is Edward Dimonov. I have a hundred voices more. And that's yeah. true. But, yeah, he actually gets... 
gets higher in, on the moral issue. But I think Yulia Lip, Yuli Lipnitsky, Yuli Lipnitsky would have beaten you easily. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, Eugene. Um, so a quick, uh, I want to ask a uh, kind of predictable question, I guess, uh, but that brings us back to the issues of media. Um, and so you started the discussion uh, with the question of comparing the contemporary setting to not the 1930s, at least, let's say the 1970s, right? And so one clear difference uh, that is often brought up in these kinds of discussions is the fact that we have these new forms of media communication. Um, in your estimation, and a question for all three of you, is that make a difference today, the fact that we have these kinds of digital media and other kind of forms and channels of uh, communication um, today? Or, or, or are we just sort of replaying the similar mm -hmm. dynamics? Um, Dimitri, you are on social media right now, so it's <laughs> natural. Uh, the question was yeah. so long. <laughs> okay. lost the sense. Please explain. Do, the social, do, so, do social media matter? Yes. Sure. Good. Yeah. I would I'd say that's absolutely crucial. I mean, just to, just to give one specific example. About a year ago, um, Alexei Navalny's group, the Anti-Corruption Foundation, produced this big investigative film into the secret financial empire of Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, showing all his yachts and villas and mansions and his vineyards in Tuscany and all the rest of it. Now, of course, if you, if you only watch Russian state t television, you would not hear a single word about it, needless to say. And yet, about 25 million people in Russia watch that film on YouTube, on Facebook, on Kontakte, on Twitter, on all these other kind of uh, social networks and social media. And tens of thousands went to the streets to protest. This was the first big wave of protest on March 26th of last year. That was followed by several more. And then the next one is coming up on, on the 5th of May. And this just, I, give, I, th I think, gives a very good illustration that there is now this whole parallel media scene that is outside the reach, and it's outside the control of the Kremlin regime. That is not censored. They're trying to. I mean, as you know, they're trying to block uh, now quite a lot of opposition websites. And actually, this is also circles back to what we started this discussion from, is that you know when Putin came to power, he would shut down or destroy large nationwide television independent networks with tens of millions of audiences. Now they are trying to block you know, even opposition websites with maybe a few dozen, a few tens of thousands of, of audiences. Just a few months ago, for example, the Russian prosecutor general has ordered all the websites associated with, with uh, our movement, the Open Russia movement, which I'm a part of, to, to block them all, to, to shut them all down. Uh, there are several other media uh, organizations and opposition organizations whose websites are blocked, like Granyu, for example, an independent online newspaper. So these are websites that had audiences maybe you know, 50, 60, 100,000 people at max. So now the, the Kremlin is not even content to have them operate freely. Uh, as a side to that, I have to say that sometimes these attempts are quite ridiculous because even for somebody like myself, I'm a complete cretin in everything when it comes to technical things. I know nothing about technology, but it takes me, you know, when I'm in Moscow on my, on my iPhone, 30 or 40 seconds to open any of the quote unquote blocked websites because you can use VPN, you can use proxy servers, you can use Opera Turbo browser which goes around it. So uh, just last week, as you know, the Russian government has begun uh, blocking Telegram, a popular online messenger. And you know, two weeks on, they've shut down quite a lot of other websites, including the website of the ministry that was responsible for blocking uh, Telegram, Roskom Nadzor. But Telegram is alive and well. So uh, as you know, you know, Russian people are creative that way, including technologically. So, so these attempts to block social media, I don't think they're going to be successful. And to your question, it's, it's very important to have them because it gives us a space that is unthinkable, a space for discussion that is unthinkable in, in state-controlled media outlets. Um, okay. So, I have a couple of points. Uh, uh, first. first uh, <laughs> <laughs> you no, 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 but this should, be, this should be questions, and then I'll collect a couple of questions, and then I will ask sure, so that we sure. move forward with the first questions. Question to you about And this is really proving the point that you're not making, that she can do whatever she wants. Because this is not, okay, a, no, it's not a coincidence. That's a, that's a question. Is this, that Dostoevsky says that if God does not exist, everything is permitted. And so this is what Dmitry is saying, that Russia now has in this position. 
However, slavoj žižek making opposite point. Um, if God not you exist, ask a question. Let me finish. Uh, so nothing is permitted. It's because you go to God and ask him to relieve you from all your sins. And if you don't have this possibility, actually nothing is permitted. So I am not exactly sure which case uh, now in Russia. And my last point is that this is two fractions here who argue what is better, KGB and the KKPSS or KGB and free travel. All, the, all points are worse. You cannot now say that it was better because 60 books, one book, 0.5 book. This is two very convoluted system. None of them should it exist. Okay, great. As uh, we say in Russia, uh, I mean, to quote a famous um, the chairman of the Russian parliament, a round table is not a place for discussion. <laughs> right, <laughs> right? So, so I keep collecting questions. Quest oh, okay. The, for those who, who doesn't know, the chairman of State Duma said the parliament is not for a place for discussion. So I just rephrased it for our case. So, your well, question? I have a question for Vladimir. My name is Elena Gabova, and I will be uh, on a panel. I'm a social scientist, will be on a panel later uh, in the afternoon. So, well, uh, you said that, well, uh, your opposition to Putin was not about, well, politics or economics, but, you know, moral, on the moral grounds, these people are just wrong, etc. And, well, I can understand that, but uh, do you think that, um, well, uh, many people in Russia, where I do not live, so I know Russia by, from, from the internet mostly, that many people who, uh, well, actually, stand with Putin, not against Putin. They believe that it's the people who oppose Putin who are totally corrupt. These are the people who sold out Russia in, in the 1990s. These are, well, this very Kuczynski who was put under arrest one month after Putin came to power. He is the person who is responsible for, well, let's not start. So, well, they see these, the opposition as much worse than Putin, actually, they see Putin as the person who came at some point and you know, somehow, well, made it a little more predictable, a little better place for lots of people who were totally left out by the night. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll then repeat your quest question to Vladimir. Could, could I collect more questions? Yeah, please. Um, if you're on Facebook, Mr. Bukov, um, you might be an unusual Russian because most of you on contact, you're on the classic here. Um, oh. No, that was an impolite thing to say. Because of your age, yes, but of our age, no. <laughs> that's, that's just like pe pe people in Russia generationally divided into Facebook and Vkontakte people. And when you say to the Facebook people that they should be on Vkontakte, this is a kind of, yeah. You said that we are old. Yeah, OK, we are. <laughs> operating within a non-independent overall um, structure, Gazprom. So I'm curious as to your thoughts in general on how a how independent content producers can operate under um, non-independent or government-affiliated overall structures, and perhaps also um, in, in the Soviet case that you were talking about earlier, Mr. Buiko, like how um, people cannot speak uh, metaphorically freely um, in um, in their literary production in, within a censorship system? Uh, okay, so first, uh, I, I will, I will re repeat the, uh, oh, and I'll remember, the questions. Yeah. Okay, so on Yulia Lipnitska first, I think she is totally not responsible for the uh, Crimea affair and for the Donbass invasion. And I think it's wrong, it's wrong uh, factually, that's wrong morally to connect uh, success of sportsmen to this kind of uh, to this kind of things. This is just an intellectual construct and a wrong one. Now, important question. Uh, Dmitry, God existence. Uh, 
does it exist for Russia today and does it matter? Does it place any constraint on what we, what we do in Russia? Yes. <laughs> well, that's a big question, you should say. <laughs> you know that being a writer, because you know, calling yourself a poet is a compliment. Being just a writer, I must believe. Because the feeling of aesthetic hierarchy is normal for any creating person, for any creative person. But the belief of most of Russians has nothing in common with philosophy or with religion. That's maybe a kind of paganism, <coughs> uh, of paganism, the new version of paganism. They don't believe in God. They believe in chief, uh, the great chief of some strange robber's band, which gives them luck sometimes if they pray in the correct way. Uh, there is no Christianity in Russia. By the way, Russians, you know, they reflect their situation. The only reflection of the situation is main Russian genre, anecdote, we call it. The short, funny story. And so, God's son, God's father, and Spiritus Sancti are discussing how to spend holidays. For example, Passover holidays. Godfather says, I'll go to Jews, I love them. Spiritus Sancti says, I'll go to Americans, they believe in me. And Christ says, I'll go to Russians, never been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then a related question to Vladimir. So the, you said that opposition opposes Putin on moral grounds. But the thing is, the hard fact is that a lot of people who support Putin do think that they do this exactly on moral grounds? Mm -hmm. Very important question. Yeah. Thank you uh, for it. And I'll just very briefly, I want to say to your point about the debate being between KGB and Communist Party and KGB and Good Coffee. I, I don't know who in particular you're referring to, but I, I, as I hope I made it clear, this is exactly this why. This is KGB and Good Coffee, and this is KGB and the KKP. Okay, so I just wanted to make clear that, you know, neither of them no, are. Why? Yeah, because. Yeah. The, and the whole point of calling the system a postmodern dictatorship is because the essence is dictatorial, but we do have good coffee, as Constantine said. And, 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 and you know, for, for me, the primary problem is that we have a dictatorship. We have opposition leaders being killed. We have the lack of free and fair elections. And frankly, it doesn't matter if you have a good coffee or not when that is the case. And that's a fundamental deep problem with this regime. So I just wanted to make that clear. I agree, but so this both regimes are bad. Okay, okay, sir, 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 we could, you could discuss this. They both are bad, but and they both, I wanted to ask both, in essence, they're equal to each other, despite the coffee. And that's the yes, important point. You. Uh, on your quick point, no, I, 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 wanted, I wanted just to repeat this. I will repeat, and then you, you answer. So the question, the, question the question was about that Obviously, like major media platforms in Russia, they are either state-owned or state-captured. But this cannot be said about content producers. So do, do, do you think that there is like a substantial content producing freedom still in Russia? Uh, when it comes to social media, generally, yes. Although we do have people sitting in prison today for likes and shares on Facebook and on Vkontakte. People Outside of Moscow, right? In Tver, right. There's a yes, teacher in Tver. Course, yeah. So if you look at the latest list of political prisoners uh, in the Memorial Human Rights Center, if you take together political and religious prisoners, it's more than 100 people. If you take just political prisoners, I think it's about 50 people. And that includes people who are sitting in prison for likes or shares on Facebook of contacting. So, so let's not think that this, the social media freedom is absolute. Far from it. But it's, of course, it's much better compared to the, to the state. Uh, to the state entities. Uh, Echo Moscow is, is an interesting case because, as you rightly point out, it, is, it does formally belong to Gazprom Media, which is a state-affiliated entity, but it does maintain an independent editorial line. I think that's one of those elements on the facade of a postmodern dictatorship, that they need something to point out to. Okay, well, we do have independent media. There it is. Um, and of course, if you talk about Echo Moscow, the content producers are pretty free, and you have people uh, like Dmitry and others who are free to say what they want. But again, to put it in context, it's only about three or four million audience in a country of 146 million population. So, so uh, just that's just actually what I wanted to ask. Dmitry, when you post something on Facebook or contact you or somewhere, do you, like, do you feel constrained? I mean, do you have a kind of um, stop words that you think, oh, no, I shouldn't, 
I shouldn't try this. Never. It's just physiological. I, for example, to scratch my leg, uh, it doesn't touch uh, my brains at all. It's mechanical. Uh, I must say that writing in Facebook and writing the novel, for example, writing the poem, two different processes. Uh, and so it's very sad that most of Russians now speak mechanically, write mechanically, use Facebook mechanically. That's just physiological. No real thoughts. I must say that social net kills your brain. Oh, is, does it kill your brain? Or it gives you an opportunity to see that others' brains are killed? I mean, like when, if you would not have seen what these people would post to contact you, wouldn't, they think, wouldn't you think of, of them better? But now you see what they post and you think of them worse. I would think of them better if they refuse of it totally. Because that's just the substitute of creation, substitute of thought and so on. Just a very pitiful change. Okay, we, we're going to collect a lot. No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't answer the, the question yet. Just a follow-up. Uh, are you saying there are no really taboo subjects for you to Taboo subjects? Question to Taboo subjects. Do, do we have tab taboo subjects? Yeah, very many. Yeah. Could, could we, the first of all is territorial colonies. That's the main taboo. So there is no freedom. Yeah, there and self-direction of small territories. Small self-direction of cities, self-direction of some areas in Russia. Uh, even if you try to mention constitution, which gives you the right of self-direction, that's a call to destroy Russian homelessness. Now, f people certainly get prosecuted for this. People, people do get prosecuted for sharing uh, blog posts and to writing on social media f uh, about like independence of um, independence. What they're writing about? I, I wanted to say Crimea, but of course, it's it's not right. Wait, but, 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 but yeah. <laughs> no, that's just so, a, a so diffi I, difficult way. I mean, could you rush? In, could you? Okay, that, that's difficult. No, what I'm saying is that this is like, is this a real taboo? I mean, would you not yeah, write about real, this? Yeah. That's real and very dangerous taboo. You shouldn't say, for example, that you want to transfer Russia into the United States of Russia to make all the states self directed, like Siberia. That's the call for separation. I had such experience. Uh, Sergei Medvedev wants like, to make an, what is an intellectual taboo point. He said that uh, he uh, basically wrote an op-ed uh, saying that Russia should not invest in acquiring Arctic, that we have so many uh, natural resources that actually spending money on acquiring more natural resources just does not make sense. And President Putin said that, uh, he didn't say that this was a stu stupid remark, he, was, he said Priduruk. He would, yeah. Half full, yeah. So basically, that's a kind of thing that you should not say. I mean, that we have too much territory or natural resources, that's almost taboo. I mean, that's crazy. crazy but it's important, I think, to say. to say that there are still people in Russia who do speak about these taboo subjects. Some people pay with, uh, for this with their liberty, like the people who are in prisons for likes and shares. Some people pay with it. Uh, for this mm -hmm. with their lives, like Boris Nemtsov, who was open, speaking openly about all these things, including Crimea. But there are still people, it's important to say this, there are still people in Russia who do touch on these so-called taboo subjects. Oh, it's it's exactly. This cuts it both, both ways. People who, most prominent people, most famous people, and universally loved people like Boris Nemtsov, they got killed for saying these things. Right. So there is... A, a there are taboo subjects, uh, but there are still people who talk about them. Yeah. And I know we're running out of time, but I do want to answer Elena's question, because I think it's a very important one that this, this kind of um, uh, line that you articulated, that's exactly the line uh, very often that the Kremlin propaganda is putting out. They're saying that you know, these were these horrible 90s, Lihi, Divinosti, these wild 90s when everything was, was lots of corruption, uh, everybody was stealing everybody. You know, of course, there was a lot of corruption in the 90s, but it was child's play compared to the level of corruption we have under Vladimir Putin. When Putin came to power, according to Forbes magazine, we had four billionaires in Russia in US dollar terms. Now we have 110, and most of them are Putin's old friends from the KGB, from the Ozera Cooperative near St. Petersburg, from St. Petersburg City Hall, his old judo partners like Arkady Rotenberg, all these people who have used their friend, their pal Putin being in power to, to acquire these, this enormous wealth at the expense of the Russian state and, and Russian taxpayers. 
And so that is, that is exactly the line that the Kremlin propaganda uses. And I, I also have to say that it works less and less. Because, of course, now we have, we have a whole generation of people in Russia who don't remember the 90s. And Putin's been in power for almost 19 years. You know, the people who came to vote for the first time in a so-called presidential election in March, who turned 18 and became citizens that came to vote, they are the people who were born under Vladimir Putin. This is how long he's been in power. So this 90s, horrible 90s image, well, first of all, a lot of it is not true. I, I do remember the 90s and like these young people. So uh, this wasn't is it certainly horrible? not... Sorry? Wasn't it sort of horrible? Uh, well, I, I want to come back to what you yourself said, Constantine, that nothing is black and white. Yeah, there okay. were many difficulties and many oh, problems. Yes, yeah. But we also had free elections in the 90s. Yeah. We had independent media in the 90s. I think the 80s were more was, horrible. Yeah. I was too young to remember that. But there was, the 90s were also the only period in Russian history, or at least in modern Russian history, when we had no political prisoners in Russia, not a single one. Think about it. So this is important. So the 90s were not definitely black and white, the way they're being painted by, as black by the Putin propaganda. But this is becoming less and less effective, frankly, because you know, these young people, the kinds of people who have been going out to protest uh, following Navalny's calls since March of last year, over this past year, to protest on, against the Putin regime on the streets, <coughs> they frankly don't care about the 90s. Even, even the were as bad as the Putin propaganda says. They care about today. They care about the enormous corruption today, all these secret assets that Putin's friends and pals are making. They care about the lack of free elections, the lack of independent media, the lack of accountability, the abuses in the judicial system. They don't care what, you know, Dmitry Kiselyov tells them about 1995. They care about all the abuses and the corruption that's happening today, and that's, I think, is a very important, important point. Well, I, I think we should conclude and continue maybe the conversation over lunch. Yeah. Thank you. So actually, thank you. Yes, thank you.